Buenos dias y todos en Madrid. Good afternoon to our viewers around the world. Magandang gabi po sa mga nanonood sa Pilipinas. I am Consul Adrian Cruz of the Philippine Embassy in Spain and I welcome our viewers to the Philippine Embassy in Spain FB Live webinar. On behalf of Ambassador Philip Luillier, we are pleased to bring to you this webinar, Reimagining Enrique, Inspiring Historical Fiction Beyond the First Encounter. Joining me at the sidelines is Consul Mikhail de Jos. And in this webinar, we are going to take a closer look at the historical facts, the myths, and the legend of the man who is simply called Enrique. The Philippine Embassy in Madrid is proudly co-sponsoring this webinar with Tahanan Books and the Magellan Elcano Study Center of Partido State University in Camarines Sur. I would like to introduce my co-host. She is a communications practitioner, urban sketcher, and storyteller. Her professional experience started with established creative agencies before she moved to consultation work for nonprofit organizations like Galing, Galing Pook Foundation, Culture Aid Incorporated, among others. She is presently working as a marketing manager of Tahanan Publishing Incorporated. So, dear viewers, mga nanonood, please say hello to Meg Rojas. Hi, Meg. Hi. Good evening from Manila. Meg, how do you feel about the webinar? Um, we're excited. I'm excited to hear from our panelists on the and learn from the sampling of creative works in literature and film uh, inspired by Enrique. So I'm, I'm in, intrigued in, on their take on this historical figure. Yes. So we have our, as our speakers for today, I'll just, I'll just list them. And then we will give a background when, before we speak, they are Renny Rojas. Renny, hi. So Carla Passis, Carla, hello. Kidlat Tahimik, hi Kidlat. And Professor Danny, Danilo Herona. Hi, Prof. Uh, hi. Prof, hi, Prof Danny. Hi, Kandian. So we're privileged that Tahanan Books for Young Readers also offered to provide us a short video about Enrique. And what uh, you will see here are pictures from the book, First Around the Globe, The Story of Enrique. I have it, I have it, it's really nice. The co-writers are Renny Rojas and Mark Singer, and the beautiful pictures are done by Arnel Mirasol. So, Consul Mikhail, let's uh, have the short video. This story was inspired by an article written by the late eminent Filipino historian Carlos Carino entitled The First Man Around the World. It told of a young slave simply named Enrique who traveled around the globe with his master Ferdinand Magellan during the first quarter of the 16th century. Historians have referred to Enrique as Black Henry or Enrique El Negro. The chronicler Antonio Pigafetta said he was Sumatran. Others have variously described him as being a Malacan or Malay. Magellan himself called Enrique a native of Malacca in his will, but Mr. Carino contends that the explorer wanted to keep Enrique's birthplace a secret. Relying in part upon the writings of Stefan Zwick, Carino concludes that Enrique was a Filipino, specifically a Cebuano, having returned in 1521 to a place where his native language was spoken. If indeed Enrique had began and ended his journey in Cebu, he would have completed the first circumnavigation of the globe. According to Mr. Quirino, Magellan never did. Quirino argues that prior to his discovery of the Philippines, Magellan may have only traveled as far east as Saba in northern Borneo. After purchasing Enrique in Malacca, he returned to Europe traveling west. 
When he set out from Spain in 1519, he continued to the west, going only as far as Mactan, Cebu, where he died. That gap between Mactan and Saba would deprive Magellan the credit of being the first man around the globe. The Basque, Sebastián del Cano, who completed the homeward voyage after Magellan died, is said to be the first person to make a continuous voyage around Europe. But Del Cano did not return to Spain until a year and a half after Enrique returned to Cebu. So it would be by default that the slave, who was probably unaware of his own achievement, was the first man to circle our planet. Although Enrique's origins may never be established, we can safely say that he existed. We all know that he was a loyal servant, fought side by side with his master at the Battle of Mactan. By all accounts, Enrique and Magellan had a special bond. Ian Cameron, in his book Magellan and the First Circumnavigation of the World, claims that Enrique later conspired against the Spaniards because they betrayed his beloved master at the Battle of Mactan, having left him for dead. Today, however, the contemporary research of Filipino historian Dr. Danilo Matipidirvana asserts that Enrique conspired with the local chiefs of Cebu to avenge himself on Magellan's designated successor, Duarte Barbosa, who refused to grant Enrique his freedom even after his master's untimely death. According to Dr. Herona, the massacre of Spaniards that resulted further pushed this Asian slave to drift into the realm of mythology. We may never know the truth about Enrique, but as publishers living in the Philippines, knowing how Filipinos have always traveled far and wide, we found the story of Enrique the First Balikbayan to be an interesting and not impossible yarn. In creating a picture book based on Mr. Kirina's account, we saw an opportunity not only to entertain young readers, but to acquaint them with the role of the Philippines in the age of discovery. We hope that through this book, they will learn more about our amazing world, just as Enrique did. Maraming salamat. Muted, sir. Muted. Maraming salamat po sa Tahanan Book for Young Readers. For giving us the opportunity to 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 do uh, this brief video using the pictures from your book, so I'll turn it over now, Meg. I'll turn it over to you. Yes. So for our first speaker, Renny Rojas is a writer, editor, and publisher. Her first her picture book ay naku won a National Children's Book Award in an anthology she edited Hanggang sa Muli, Homecoming Stories for the Filipino Soul, was shortlisted in 2012 by the Manila Critics Circle for Best Anthology in English. In 2019, she won a first prize, Carlos Palanca Memorial Award, for her children's story, Pretty Peach and the Color Matching Kaleidoscope. She co-authored the children's picture book, First Around the Globe, The Story of Enrique, in 1997, which was reissued in 2017 as a 20th anniversary edition. Uh, the screen is yours, Renny. Thank you, Meg. And thank you to my uh, fellow speakers. Um, I'm so glad that we're all here to discuss this, uh, this uh, person who lived over 500 years ago. And here we are in the year 2020, a pandemic year, and we are talking about a man who has seized our imagination. Enrique El Negro, he is called, or Black Henry, uh, and I think he is known by other names. But I want to ask, I want to attempt to answer the question, why Enrique? Uh, and to answer that, I want to backtrack a bit and talk about how almost 30 years ago, uh, Mark Singer and I started Tahan and Books and we came to Manila after living in the United States and we had to make friends with authors and artists. Uh, many of them we hadn't known and we had to introduce ourselves to be able to start our publishing program. And we met Carlos Quirino. Uh, this was back in 
1992 or so. And Carlos Quirino was a tall, handsome uh, historian who was very lucky, I thought, because he had found his metier in writing history. He loved writing history. And many years later, he was awarded National Artist for Historical Literature uh, uh, by Malacanang. This is a man who loved writing history and wanted nothing else but to write about history. And I remember him telling me that his wife took care of all the household affairs and paid all the bills and did all these things just so that he could sit alone in his library and do what he loved, which was to write about history. Well, one day, Carlos, Mr. Quirino came to us and with a, a manuscript that he had written where he said uh, he, he claimed that uh, this man Enrique could have been could have been a Filipino, uh, could have been a Cebuano in particular. And I remember that we were so enthralled with the story because it had all the elements of a good of a good yarn or a good story. Although we could not prove Carlos Quirino's contention, we said, well, maybe we could do a children's book and call it a yarn, right, for what it is. So why was Enrique a, a great story? And I'll tell you why. First, it was set in the age of discovery. Um, this was the time of, of uh, uh, expedition and exploration. And then it was really a 10-year saga that involved an abduction. I mean, this is all conjecture, but it involved an abduction, kidnapping by pirates, uh, Enrique was then sold to the slave trade and sold in Malacca to Magellan. It uh, talked about him being whisked off to Europe and where he served as a, uh, where he served his master faithfully. And um, on the voyage to the, towards the, to, towards Asia, the Spice Islands, uh, the trip, they had five caravels that traveled, was played by storms, scurvy, people getting sick, mutinies on board. And um, when they landed uh, in the Philippines and dropped anchor, uh, there was the ensuing Battle of Mactan where there was an, a betrayal and a massacre afterwards. So this was a great story. Um, and and uh, it was illustrated by Arnel Mirasol. I don't know if you have the picture of Arnel and uh, who had used himself as a model for uh, illustrating the character of Enrique on the cover. So there's, there's Arnel, um, who had to, he read Ian Cameron's book from cover to cover um, uh, to be able to research this book. And we are so glad that he did, so much so that we came out with this book in 1997 and 20 years later, we reissued the 20th anniversary edition of Enrique. So later on, I look forward to um, contributing to the general uh, discussion about why Enrique was, um, is, is the object of this talk. But that's just to give you a, a general background as to how we got to know Enrique and how we got to publish his story and we hope many, many more children and adults out there will get to know Enrique. Thank you. Thank you, Rennie. It was really uh, um, very, very good of you to come up with this idea for, for a children's book because we really need to teach our, our children something about history. And Enrique really is a good place to start because it steers the imagination. Thank you for that. For our next speaker, uh, we'll have uh, Carla Passis. Uh, she is a writer of children's books and young adult novels. She is a retired faculty member of the literature department of De La Salle University. In retirement, she continues to write, paint, and garden in her house in Laguna, where she lives with her three dogs and two birds. Carla? Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, I'm sorry I had to change venue because my two birds were, were very, were very, were getting very active. Okay, anyway, um, 
in the same way that Renny, I read the same article that Renny did, the, the article of Carlos Querido. Uh, I think it was printed in the Inquirer. And that immediately, I said, oh my gosh, I have to find out more about this boy. Uh, only because my my motives were different. Well, in, well, say the same in that it is an adventure story, so it is a perfect um, how do you say it's a perfect topic for kids or not topic, framework for a children's for a young adult novel. But in my case, I thought, well, there's all this. It's it's probably. Uh, supposedly, you know, it's it's not. There's nothing sure about who Enrique was, and for me that was perfect because then that really allows for the writer to fill up all those gaps that we don't know or we we're asking questions about. So that's the. I guess that's how historical fiction is created, right? When uh, when we have this wonderful story, but it, we don't have enough facts so we make it up right based on the context right but the other thing that I really that also pushed me to write this novel and I have to say it wasn't easy because I had to do research and I really don't like research I mean I'm really allergic to research which is very strange since I come from the university right but it was the um I I remember I had to to overhaul my manuscript the first time, right? Because there was, it was just like, you know, in research, it's like some, you find something and then all of a sudden something will pop out and then you realize, oh my God, what I just said was was not right. And so it, it, it took me a couple of years to finish this novel. Uh, but, the, but the other underlying reason that I really felt I had to finish it was that, we have in in Enrique a potential hero for Filipinos. Like um, that is what I think we're lacking in our in our literature is that we don't for children anyway is that we don't have enough heroes that our children can emulate. Or, or, and so I thought this was perfect. He he is and. Uh, I was actually also basing it on another framework, which is the hero's journey by Joseph Catlow, which is based on myths. Okay, so um, the, his his going from being a slave to Magellan's interpreter. So no, he is no longer his slave status has disappeared, and he is now not the equal of Magellan, but he is still. Uh, very important to the expedition, right? So that for me was a, a hero's journey. And the fact I think that uh, Carlos Quirino also says that he decided to stay in the Philippines, he did, or in, in that area, right? And didn't go back with Sebastian Elcano. So, um, so that was one. And the other one was that, okay, maybe it is historical fiction, but at least it's told from the point of view of the conquered rather than from the conqueror or the Western point of view. At least this is coming from the, well, that like it, um, it's coming from the bottom, right? Uh, so that was, that was my motivation for writing and the, for writing the, the young, the novel and for finishing it because I thought it was a very important story to tell. Yeah. Thank you, Carla. Ayun. So, nalaman natin na uh, based on our two authors. So, both wrote for children. Yung isa is for younger children. So, picture book. And then yung isa naman is for young adults. Um, nakita natin na both of you were inspired by Enrique as a potential hero for children. So, what do you think would be... Um, um, a good jumping point for writers who would want to um, start in historical fiction. Renny, go. Oh, okay. Carla, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, well, uh, they should have an interest in history. 
right? And should actually go beyond and start, um, how, how do I say? It? Yeah, an interest in history and then a, and, a, and a desire to know more. Know more about their country, know more about their past, know more about actually people who are not well known, right? We should go beyond Rizal and Mabini and Marcelo H. Del Pilar and then and start looking for all those uh, many other heroes that because they're not, uh, they didn't die or they didn't fight the Spaniards or uh, you know, they, but they still are heroes, right? Like I'm sure in Ifugao there are so many but they're not being told, right? In, in all, in, in, in uh, Bicol, I'm sure there are many heroes there that whose stories are not also being told simply because they're, uh, they, you know, they didn't die. So, I mean, because, well, our, our, our definition for, for hero in Filipino is also very problematic because it says to be a, the definition of hero is someone who died for his God, his or her country. That's, that's the definition of hero in Filipino. So, yeah, so, there are so many more whose stories need to be told, right? Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Renny? Uh, yes, I, uh, for, for those young people who want to write children's stories, for me, there's nothing that beats the power of story. And uh, Enrique's uh, tale has all the elements. In fact, uh, uh, we always thought that the story of Enrique would make a wonderful Disney movie. So I don't know if any Hollywood is listening. Uh, all his escapades would, would really be, be good uh, as a Disney film, I think. Um, however, one could argue that um, great characters, or as Carla says, heroes, are those who practice agency. And um, for me, one could argue that in this case of Enrique, agency doesn't come into play so much because if we call him the first Balik Bayan that ever lived, the first man to circle the globe, he did it not because he wanted to, not because he, uh, that was his goal in life, he did it by default because the winds of history just carried him on this journey and he ended up uh, allegedly back in Cebu where he was, as Carlos Quirino claims, where he was born. So in terms of agency, I don't think we have it uh, in, in terms of addressing the issue of how did he get to circ circumnavigate the globe? He was an accident of fate. Um, but in all these other uh, uh, instances in his life, um, there, there was an element of heroism that we can visit later on in this discussion. Thanks. Now we have Kurt from our writers. Um, Conjun Adi, you may yeah. you want to introduce the next one. Carla, Reni, thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving us a backgrounder of Enrique. Um, Yung mga books ninyo, it really inspired me to, to do some more research. Of course, we will hear the historical background on that kay Prof. Danny later on. Pero one thing that I, I realized no, when I was just reading your books, pwede, like what Renny had said, pwede, pwede talaga ipasa pelikula ang, 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 ang uh, exploits ni Enrique. And that is why it will be now very interesting to hear from our next speaker. Our next speaker is the artist and filmmaker, Eric De Gia, who is better known as Kidlat Tahimik. He is our national artist for film. He has made significant contributions to the development of Pinoy indie films since winning the International Critics Prize at the Berlin Film Festival in 1977 for his film Perfume Nightmare. Kidlat confesses that filmmaking was his voyage into the Filipino cultural soul by filming his personal introspections rather than producing box office hits, Kidlat focused on how our colonial legacy makes us ignore our ancient indigenous wisdom. Kidlat is here to share with us yung views niya about Enrique, 
siya ang President, Secretary, Treasurer, PRO, and Official Cameraman of the Enrique Fans Club in Hapao, Ifugao. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet Kidlat Kahimik. Don't begin after the circumnavigation of the globe. Enrique, the slave of Magellan, now a free man, has returned home to his native village. On the soundtrack, we should hear sounds of a wild boar. not a toy for Enrique. The yo-yo is recorded in a 17th century French document as an original Philippine jungle weapon. Okay. <laughs> Siguro, most people uh, who have read history books may have all kinds of notions kung anong Enrique na ito. <clears throat> I, uh, I probably didn't do as much research uh, in, in an academic way. <laughs> I picked up visuals and I picked up ideas and I was intrigued by the survivor. No? Itong si Enrique was a survivor. And yeah, I think I agree that he also should be a hero <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> What made him survive a voyage like that? It was not an easy thing. I think the 17 survivors who reached um, Sevilla, that was a big feat. At yung mga dumating na sa Pilipinas after the 99 day voyage across the Pacific Ocean. Wow, malaking survival skills. But I, I try to, I can env envision Enrique as a, meron siyang cosmology Meron siyang kaalaman ng katutubo. He had some indigenous knowledge that maybe just told him, you just keep following that setting sun and you will come back to where you came from. Siguro parang si E.T. <laughs> he also had a homey instinct. Home, home, tahanan, nariyan na. So this is how I allowed him to <clears throat> enter my psyche. And that's why I lasted also a long voyage. I'm a survivor of a 35-year filmmaking journey. <laughs> in ko yung film ko in 1979. You see, you see my how young I was. Ako yung nakabahag don. <laughs> and um, uh, <clears throat> I stopped the film maybe in 1985 or 86. Because uh, my three sons were growing up and I said, I want to shell the film. Muna. I don't want to be a prisoner of my film. So I, I'll come back to it in five years, six years, which became 25 years, 30, 35 years. Anyway, um, I imagine Enrique as a, if Magellan was the master of the voyage, and we all know about him. It's all documented. Even the cargo that they had and all his letters, and even his last will and testament, which still exists today in Sevilla. You know, on the day of my death, my slave Enrique de Malaca shall become a free man and shall receive 10,000 maravedis or something like that. <clears throat> which uh, I think it was Renu said he must have been a special person to Magellan. And they, and they usually had several slaves, but this one special out he, Siningil out niya, oi, I have to give him some inheritance money and I have to give him his freedom. So I, I think if, Ma, if, Ma, if, Ma, if Magellan was the logistics master, he was talking to kings, 
He was uh, talking, negotiating with bankers, the Augsburg bankers. He was consulting university map makers and also consulting with both engineers, no? Mr. Logistics, yeah, but I think in the end, the spiritual master of the voyage must have been this indigenous person who somehow knew where to go. And maybe in the Tierra del Fuego, with the, trying to find the place where, which alley to follow, maybe he made a difference. But this is something that I think I cannot prove as a histor historian. <laughs> maybe so I always felt that making my story, um, the historians would lynch Kidlat Tahimi <laughs> because of my freedoms. So I, 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 I have been wearing an Ifugao um, bahag, no? But it's more a tribute to the indigenousness of his uh, and how he survived. Let's take a short clip at how did Enrique de Malaca meet this master slave? Let's look at clip two and uh, Magellan is in, in the flea mar uh, in the flea market of uh, Malacca, looking for furniture. the master meets the slave in a buy one, take one deal. Okay. <laughs> I think you begin to uh, see that if I'm a, at all a historian, I'm a flippant patawa palaro uh, player. So uh, <clears throat> I, I try to show this accidental meeting between uh, Magellan and Enrique, and which eventually brings us to Europe. But if we look at Enrique as just a slave in the stereotype of that word, no? Um, yeah, we always think of a cruel master, but and, uh, and uh, just, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, master. Uh, <clears throat> but I think more and more uh, Magellan must have learned, has realized that deep down this guy was something special. I, I have a scene where they play chess, you know, and uh, he, He's been taught chess and for the first time he beats his master in the chess game. Okay, uh, let's now take a quick look at a little uh, historical uh, clip when the uh, Magellan makes his case in for the King Carlos I of Spain. A flash forward a couple of years. <laughs> Magellan has quit Portugal because the king of Portugal refuses to finance the big voyage that Magellan now plans to find a western route. He's now in Spain, in Sevilla, and after two years he finally gets an appointment with King Carlos I. Like a filmmaker in search of a production, Magellan has not given up so easily. And now he's about to make the presentation of his life to convince King Carlos to finance his galleons in search for new routes to the Molucca Spice Islands.
what you mean. Of course. Here, okay. we are on this other part. Okay, I think um, we we might we sort of know that the uh, I think uh, Enrique was brought to the court. Uh, there, there was there were he he brought some samples, and I think it was his convincing argument that. Uh, his valet, his slave, his interpreter knew uh, the way to those islands. Uh, of course, we can't prove all those. Anyway, the thing is this: um, Are we always? Do we always have to prove uh, these his heroes that uh, um, uh, Renny has talked about? And, uh, maybe some heroes come from our mythology and alam and mga alamat mga. So, uh, but. I see over the years, my 40 years working with him, I think I have come to believe that there is, well, we know that he existed, but it was just mentioned five or six times in Enrique's book, in, in, in Pigafetta's book. But uh, there have been many writers now who have referred to him as the, the possibility, besides Stephen Zweig and Cameron and all these other people. Uh, I even saw as comic books you know, I went to Portugal last year, and the Portuguese and the Spanish are now trying to claim this this guy. And there is some comic book from the Portuguese POV, no? And they show there, wow, the guy who killed Magellan. There's a flashback at the end of his comic books, and the guy who killed Magellan was not one of us. It was Elcano. <laughs> Maybe trying to get ready, trying to get that honor. Never mind. Whatever the case, again, I think we're also entitled to our POV, and maybe we will put our emphasis not on all the opposites and locusts, you know, opposites and locusts, uh, <laughs> opposite and locusite. But if we, I'm piecing things together and coming to this picture of an indigenous person who could have guided his master by the nose. Let's take a last a look at the last clip of the historical Battle of Mactan. Again, I, I, I make my own artistic license. And let's just see how the battle ends, OK? Clip four. My, my, my starting point is that uh, Lapu-Lapu does not want to do a physical battle in the beginning because maybe it's going to cause deaths on both sides. And he starts with a noise barrage to try to in, uh, expel the invaders. My poetic license, okay. Mikhail? Let's wait for Mikhail to show the video. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Thank, sorry, we're back. Sorry, na disconnect lang technical problems. Sharing the fourth video. Akala ko ako lang maraming technical problems in my head. There's okay, we're live na ba? Ready go. There's the sound of anklong sounds there, no? There's no sound. Anyway, this is a turning point where he decides he has to do a physical battle because uh, somebody on the ship fires a cannon and now Magellan resorts to real warfare with their bamboo cannons. Sorry, the sound's out. And here's the last dramatic scene. And Magellan in my film, his patron saint is San Sebastian. Okay. <laughs> so in, in a nutshell, um, kinapaka pa ako yung, I grew up for the story. I had no script. It took me um, 40 years to find a kind of an ending and it and the only way I could end it was because when I started the film again, 
40, uh, 35 years later. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was already an old man. My hair was white. I couldn't play Enrique anymore. By the way, I play Enrique because I'm the cheapest actor available. <laughs> and I'm also always on call. And I could last 40 years. Anyway, let me just close with whatever we think about Enrique. I think we don't have to always go on a, a Western, what they call an objective trip. And everything has to be supported by, because we are not the people who recorded things. We are not the people who were anal about recording our, our history. But we know about him thanks to uh, Antonio Pigafetta. And if we have artists like Rennie and um, Carla who have fleshed out a little bit and my own way of fleshing out. As a matter of fact, just let you know, I'm sponsoring a contest for 2021. And it's along that line that we, the young people don't are not exposed anymore to our heroes. They, they know about Spider-Man and they know about Captain America, pero hindi nila alam tungkol sa mga sariling bayani natin, like, um, yeah, Mapling Dulag from our part or from other parts of the country. But I think at least Lapu Lapu, I would like to have him honored next year. And I'm sponsoring a contest for that. And finally, one last thing is I have a big project in Spain, in Madrid. <laughs> I'll see you there, Adrian. I can't divulge the, the details yet, but in 2021, Kid Lataimik will tell our version of history in the land of the colonizers. <laughs> Oi, hindi tama lahat ang mga sinasabi nyo. Meron rin coming version of our history. And with that, let me say, let's tell our own story with our own bamboo camera. <laughs> my bamboo camera is my metaphor for telling the local story. I always tell the young filmmakers, don't copy the stories of Hollywood. Don't let them uh, intimidate you, just do your story. And so let me film all of you. Have a nice evening. Cut. <laughs> Uh, Meg and Abby, I, I thought if you don't mind, I just wanted to say uh, what a small world it is. Um, I don't know if you remember, but when we launched our picture book of Enrique in 1997, you were there at our book launch at the Filipino bookstore, uh, uh, which Loritan and Bookmark owned, but it's no longer around. But you had your bahag and you had some musical instruments and you you graced our book launch that day. <laughs> when I was, I was so happy that somebody else was also putting in visuals uh, our, our superhero. That should be our superhero. <laughs> well, hope to see you when you come to Baguio. Definitely. Thank you, Kidlat. Thank you for that. Alam nyo, um, there's, uh, there's already something forming, you know? Um, after si, si Reni, si Carla, and Kid Lat um, spoke about their views about Enrique. Um, isa dito is si Enrique napaka-relatable na character. And why? What, what makes him relatable? And our, our writers and, and our filmmaker here have mentioned it already, bits and pieces of it. Eh. Balikbayan, para siyang balikbayan. Eh. And, and he's a survivor. And... Um, uh, his personality nat naturally matulungin siya because he 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 is a he became a translator from a slave he became a translator. Um, he wears different hats. So, parang ano eh, We we all in a weird in a in a interesting way we all can relate to Enrique. And I think that also makes us want to believe that Enrique is a Filipino because these are the qualities that make him a Filipino. But we now have, as our last speaker, a historian who can help us maybe set the record straight. And then uh, after we hear his views, we quickly go to the question and answer portion. So our next speaker, Professor Danny Herana, he's a Filipino historian who focuses on the early Spanish colonial history in the Philippines. 
he authored numerous books and wrote articles on various aspects of national and local histories. He is an Asal Magellan scholar. He authored the book Ferdinand Magellan, the Armada de Maluco and the European Discovery of the Philippines. A lecturer in numerous national and international conferences in history. He is also a member of Philippine and European committees on the Magellan celebration and an accomplished historical painter. He is the director of the Magellan Elcano Study Center in Partido State University in Camarines Sur in the Philippines. We're honored to have you, Prof. Danny. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Konjen. Um, good evening, um, everyone. Um, it's an honor, of course, to be part of this uh, webinar on Enrique. Uh, I'm well, of course, um, I did much of my work. I relied on uh, archival documents. So I spent about 10 years working on the archival documents in the various archives in Europe, the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, um, the, um, the Biblioteca Nacional de España, Museo Naval, Real Academia de la Historia, and of course, at the Torre de Tombo in, 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 uh, in Portugal, mm. where, of course, Magellan came from. And, uh, some documents from the uh, from the uh, uh, archives in Italy because of the uh, Pigapetta's report. So I have examined them. But um, unfortunately, I don't want. I, I, of course, all of us wanted to have uh, a rallying point for our pride, uh, such as uh, Enrique as a Filipino. But um, the documents, unfortunately, seem to be going against this. Um, first of all, uh, I. I examined uh, most 16th century, if not the uh, primary document, uh, meaning say eyewitness accounts of some of uh, the members of the expedition, Hines de Mapra, and um, some of the uh, those uh, uh, interviewed by uh, Transilvanos and uh, Peter Martyr. And uh, unfortunately, all of them seem to suggest that Enrique was not a Filipino. Um, for example, uh, Fernandez de Oviedo would say that he was actually a, a Sumatran. He was from Sumatra. Uh, oh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, he was a, yeah, from Sumatra. Pigapeta also says he was from Sumatra. Um, but it was Magellan oh, in his test, uh, testem, uh, testamento. Uh, Magellan gave, made a last will and testament before he left in 1519. And it says there, that's the one of the, I would say, uh, the document which contained certain details on, on uh, Enrique. Uh, um, the most details probably that we have uh, in the world today came from the Testamento. Uh, it says that Enrique was not actually black. He was actually color loro, which of course means that he was a mulatto. In fact, another, another chronicler in the 16th century would say he has the color of a membrillo. Uh, which uh, is more about copper colored, something like that. So it was not actually black. It was not actually dark that uh, most of us have, have always uh, imagined him to be. So, um, and then it says that, of course, it says that he was either from Malacca, although Magellan says he, he was captured in Malacca. I would say uh, he became a slave of Magellan because uh, Magellan was in the expedition of the of Jorge de Albuquerque uh, when they invaded uh, Malacca in 1510, 1511. So uh, the rule there is uh, if you capture these people, then, then they, they became your slaves. And uh, um, in my estimate, he was about 17 years old at the time. Uh, he was born in 1493, and so he was captured in 14, uh, 1511. So he must have been around uh, 17 years old at the time. And since then, he was brought by Magellan to, to uh, Lisbon. And then later on, when he transferred to Seville, this guy came with him. But actually, he was not the only slave. He was not the only Asian slave of Magellan. There was another slave, which actually was a woman. And this woman was actually a Sumatran. And... Um, uh, uh, at least two 16th century uh, uh, royal chroniclers, uh, among them uh... We lost Danny for a while, but uh, let's just wait and hope he gets back soon.
okay, as we as we wait for uh, Professor Herona to come back, uh, we just want to remind our viewers. No, I'm just checking the our Facebook Live, and um, if you have questions that you would like to raise, um, please please mention it here. And um, so far, we already have uh, a few questions. But um, of course, we will just wait until Professor Danny uh, can come back. Uh, can I, I, I forgot to ask this to, to Kidlat. Um, Kidlat, yung, yung, yung film mo, matapos na siya, hindi ba? And then I understand you showed it in 2015. In, in Berlin, in, yeah. In Berlin, yes. How yeah. was the reception mm -hmm. to that movie? Perhaps you can share it to us. Well, uh, I didn't see many walkouts. You know, in film festivals, a lot of people walk out because they want to go to see other films if, if the <laughs> film is bad. <laughs> okay. But uh, I won the Caligari Prize uh, at that festival. And um, at least one, one critic said, yeah, because please, uh, I, I know uh, it was Rennie, I think, or who, who said that, or that maybe a Disney film should be made. And I, I think I, at some point, maybe, why not spread the word, no? But <laughs> you can see that my film is very, very personal and it's a very no budget film. But uh, the audience, as uh, one critic said, this is the kind of film that you, you have to let go halfway into the film and say, I'm going to let this director take me wherever he takes me. I'm not going to expect a jajan ending, you know, the kind of riding into the sunset. And I think that's what most people did. But actually, 2021, I already have seven versions, <laughs> which when I started 79, but then I already have seven versions. But now I think 2021, I'm going to say goodbye to the film and come up with a film that maybe my mother could understand. <laughs> not because we're trying to be obscure, but just because our film language is not the same as the usual thing that you see in a big production. And then sometimes we, we relate to the personal and uh, we relate to the character we're talking about, like Enrique. But I think uh, many people will be able to ride with it. No? It's just that sometimes we just expect the thousand violins, so you fall in love with, <laughs> with the actress or what. So that was the reception, and I'm, I, I think I'm going to finish it next year. That's good. You know, That's good. Annie, I, I just wanted to say that it was, we are all aware about the 500th anniversary next year of Magellan's Landing, but it was Kidlat that reached out to Carla and me months ago and he actually uh, sent us his, his film. And it's a wonderful film for anybody who, who uh, you know, is privileged enough to watch it. Go watch it. It's just marvelous. It was April 7th when I sent you my copy. Remember, April 7th was the day Enrique arrived in Cebu. So I said, OK, that's the day of the first circumnavigation. Anyway, next year, I'm going to preempt the Spanish because they're, they're, going, to, they're, they're going to celebrate 2022, <laughs> but I'm going to have a big exhibition in Spain and I'm going to say, hey, have you heard of a guy called Ikeng? Huh? Did you know about this guy? And you can all fight whether it is Magellan or Elcano who deserves it, but maybe there's a little piece of, whether you call it history or a, a, a legend, uh, you might, it might be interesting to hear this side. Because that's what Steven Zweig and all these other writers have written. Hey, this guy could have been the first person to go around the world. And I like to write with that, even if we can't prove it Yeah. in the, I, in the academic one. I'd like to explore that word legend that you mentioned, Kidlat, because uh, in the course of uh, publishing children's books for over 25 years, we've also worked with the stories of Severino Reyes, who is the man behind the Lola Bashang stories. And Severino Reyes shamelessly borrowed from fairy tales all over the world. And in the end, he made these stories his own. So the story of Enrique to me is like 
it is there is an absence of truth in the middle of it all. We don't really know what what his nationality is, but because there's a gap and there's an absence there, anybody can project their own interpretation, right? Uh, into the life of this man. So I think that's the beauty of Enrique. We can just project all our aspirations and, and what we think he should be because he is many different things to many different people. Well, as artists, uh, we can flesh him out the way we want, no? And I think it's, it's fair enough, but there's enough, enough uh, solid facts, whatever fact means, that were, they were facts that were cited written down and I think but that when you said the truth not everything that has been cited is the truth the absence does not always sometimes there are gaps that, that allow us to explore truth provided we have a few landmarks to connect us so I, I think if we're challenged by by historians or academicians or PhD people prove it to 100% that he was the first circumnavigator. I would, I would say, no, I can't prove he's the first circumnavigator, but nobody can disprove the fact that he came and could speak the language there. And if that is a circumstance that he might have been the first circumnavigator, nobody can disprove it. And as an artist, that's where we go on. But if we fight them on the battleground of the opposites and locusites, you know, opposite and locusite, those footnotes we used to make, if we always had to do it, it's an echo chamber of the academe. And I'm, I'm not disparaging um, Danilo, no? I'm just saying that it's their echo chamber. And we are freer to enter and combine different echo chambers to tell our stories. But I think making our own heroes, at least to counteract those heroes that uh, Hollywood is, is, is overdosing us with, you know? I think Duterte should fight the drug war on the films. I think that's the biggest drug <laughs> are the Hollywood films that just make all our children forget the Lola Bashang, or, or even if Lola Bashang is, is not the right story, but at least we don't get, have any attention on, on our local heroes. Please and we just left it to... Yeah, kid lad, please, indulge, please indulge me on this kid lad, no? But uh, what I really like is uh, maybe I'm really curious how the viewers um, are starting to think of who Enrique is and what's the image that they have when they try to see who Enrique is in their minds. No, um, Kidlat, you are the you are the first actor, I guess, Filipino actor, who portrayed the mm -hmm. role of Enrique. So you will be already there in the uh, Hall <laughs> of Fame. But I would like to encourage the viewers also um, later on because this this is. The, the webinar doesn't end here. Um, I would like the viewers to just share their thoughts also about how they found the, the, the webinar. So I'll take the cue from Renny. Uh, if there will be a movie that would be shown that would feature that, a movie on Enrique, who do you think? And I'm sharing this to the viewers. Sino ang sa tingin ninyo ang Pinoy actor na pwedeng gumanap sa role na Enrique? Of course, we have Kid Lat already there. So maybe let's just do a, a voting of sorts. And then um, who, who we get to vote, who, who, who are the names, we'll, uh, no, we'll capture their faces and then, and then share it to everyone. There's, uh, there's an interesting comment here no? made, made, ng, uh, made by someone who is watching, si Bayani Abariantos. Tama po si Sir Kid Lat. Si Enrique of Malacca ay hindi ordinaryo na slave. May alam siya sa cosmos. Isa po kasi sa karanasan ko bilang mandalagat. Ang bayaw ko na nakasama ko sa pangisda. No read, no write siya. Subalit may paraan siya para malaman ko nasaan ang reef sa gitna ng dagat. So actually, uh, I would like to point out to everyone, ano, yung mga nanonood sa atin ngayon, um, they come from from uh, different uh, fields, different areas. Meron po tayong nanonood ng mga historians. Meron din po mga estudyante. Uh, meron din po talaga nanonood na zero knowledge about Enrique. At uh, interesting din po ito. No? Uh, Pinoint out, huwag natin kalimutan na si Enrique ay isang marinero. At siguro nakaka-relate ito sa lahat ng mga seafarers natin ngayon. No? Um, 
si si um, Carla uh, when I was reading Carla's just, book um, she really depicted the situation that is happening there and how how bad how bad was the situation is on the on the boat so um, I could just begin to imagine nakaka relate din siguro dito yung mga marinero natin ngayon maybe Carla um, how did you feel about writing about uh, about this no when you were you were trying to to um, to describe the situation of how it was 500 years ago. Could you share us your thoughts when you were doing this? Well, well, that's what I had to do a lot of research, right? And even my illustrator, because my the the chapter book is actually illustrated. And even the illustrator Mel Silvestre had to do research on what the galleon looked like. And it, I don't think it was even a galleon. I think it was... Uh, Caravella. Caravella. Caravella, yeah. Okay. Then, uh, you know, the parts of the galleon. Even I had to do that research. The parts of the galleon. Each, uh, what was what uh, what was on the galleon. How it... Uh, all these technical stuff. But yes, what uh, what our viewer said. I did a re also research on our own... Uh, this is the situation in in the area at that time where everybody was like a were all seafarers uh they would actually uh if i remember right yes they knew where all the sand where the sand uh, bars were they all knew where the color coral reefs were they could navigate in the dark just by using the just by looking at the sky and they all they traveled by the shore but very near the shore. So, uh, and there were also a lot of pirates around. So they would all, so it was really uh, logical that Enrique would, uh, could have been captured by, by pirates and brought to, brought to Malacca to be sold, right? So, um, yeah, so it, it really, yeah, this... the, the fact that he's a saint, he, well, that he was, yes, that he was very familiar with the sea. Ang ganda ng question coming from a marinero, no? <laughs> yeah. Because um, we are we are really a nation of seafarers. Um, my wife is doing research on, um, and she she came across this theory about you know there's the um, the old Bellwood theory that the Austronesians came from China via Taiwan and then to the Philippines and then spread out because of our seafaring abilities. No? Um, seafarers have a very different set of values and I think that's where Enrique became a survivor and, and think became very valuable to his master. I, I can imagine that uh, Magellan is trying to look at his charts, he's trying to do all his mathematical calculations, he's consulting with his navigators. But he's just watching this guy who just knows itong daan, <laughs> dito tayo da daan. Uh, because he had, so he tried to uh, follow up on those, on the Austronesian um, seafarers. There's a book, uh, Katrina was the book, uh, East of, East is Eden. Uh, Eden in the East, Katrin. <laughs> Eden in the East by um, Oppenheimer. Okay, now I'm sounding like a, a citing a book, but I think this is, uh, I can also cite that for those who are academically interested as a nice background to why Enrique is such a survivor in the, the, the high seas, no? So there is also some academic backing to our uh, artistic uh, creation of, characters like Enrique. We are a nation of seafarers, period. Professor Hirona back to yeah, continue thank you, to talk. Ayan, yeah. just, uh, listen yeah. to the facts <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Megs. Yeah, well, as I was saying, I, of course, I based my, my, my findings on, on the documents. That's, that's what we are trained for as historians. Uh, but then the question is, where did this belief that uh, he was a Filipino or he was a Cebuano? I think that's a crucial issue there. Where did it come from? That I think that 
came from a certain misconception. What what Carlos Quirino did was to justify that particular misconception. The belief that okay, there is the uh, he that he was a Filipino, and then he what Quirino did was to provide certain explanations why he was a Filipino. But then the question is, where did this belief that he was a Filipino come from? I think it came from the misconception during the communication of uh, Enrique with the, uh, with the people there in uh, Suluan and Limasawa and of course later on in Cebu. Because they said that Enrique spoke and these people understood. But what they people, what these people, uh, what most Filipino historians uh, had interpreted is that because the natives of the Visayans understood what Enrique said, seemed to suggest that he was speaking a Visayan. But that is not actually the case. Enrique, I'm pretty certain, was not actually speaking Visayan. One proof of that, in fact, Pigapeta himself confessed that the chieftains in the Philippines at the time really actually uh, spoke different languages. This not only native language, not only language of Visaya, language of the Tagalog, but they were speaking even foreign languages, especially of Southeast Asia and most likely the Malay language. One concrete proof, which apparently historians did not examine, but it's already there in the work of Pigapeta, is there were certain terms, there were terms there that Pigapeta mentioned. Kata, Raya, Chita. Different historians tried to interpret that. In fact, even foreign historians tried to interpret what was that. They could not decipher what it was. In fact, Pigapeta made an interpretation, said, oh, sir, be careful, somewhat like that. That's, that's how Pigapeta apparently understood these three, uh, three strange words for, for, uh, for, uh, for his eye, for his ears. And in fact, some uh, historians, American historians, interpreted that as saying that, uh, uh, one, I think uh, Martin Noon, an, an, an American historian, saying that it means actually ipakamatay kami or ipakamatay kita. So apparently the interpretation is that the Spaniards were saying that they are going to kill them. But then if had they, uh, what I did is actually to look at the uh, at, at work of a certain John, of John Crawford uh, a British uh, expert uh, who published a work in the early 19th century on the uh, Malay grammar, uh, Malay history, was, a, was, was, a, uh, was an expert in, in this particular part of Asia. I think he was assigned there at one time as a colonial administrator, and he wrote a number of books on, uh, on um, the Malay world. And in that uh, vocabulary presented by John Crawford, there were three words which apparently uh, fit with these words mentioned by Pigateta as having been uttered by the, uh, by the Siam merchant to Humamun, Kata Raya Chita. And in that Malay dictionary, it says there that there is a certain word that says Gata, Raya, and Chita. Gata means I trembled. Raya could mean great, but it could also mean that to, 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 to plunder. And then chita is almost equivalent to our Tagalog word kita. So apparently what this Siam trader was saying was actually, I fear that we are going to be uh, plundered by the Spaniards. We, we could not decide. I was also deciphering that using the uh, uh, the uh, vocabularies written in the 1600s uh, in the Philippines by the different uh, uh, Visayan uh, uh, Visayan vocabularies, uh, particularly Mentrida, San Buenaventura, Lisboa, they do not exist in the Philippine languages. So it shows, therefore, that the language used, even by the interpreter Abu Mabun was actually Malay and not Filipino. And even Enrique was not speaking in Visayan language, but apparently he was speaking Malay. The reason is because the intention of Magellan was that, of course, the Philippines. His intention was to travel to the Spice Islands, where 
Enrique could have come from. Either he was a Sumatran or he was a um, Malacan. And most likely, he could have been a Sumatran because of the other woman who probably was Enrique's wife. The one, the, this uh, Sumatran woman was mentioned by several chroniclers as, as having been brought by Magellan during the consultation with the consultative body of Charles V. So, and they said, she's, uh, there was in fact a description about this woman, a uh, slave woman. Uh, she was pretty, very, very eloquent, very, very intelligent, just like in a way, uh, Enrique de Malaca. So all this evidence suggests that apparently Enrique was not a Filipino. Uh, at least there are, there are scraps of uh, written evidence which suggest so. Other than that, most of them are probably oral traditions or speculations. I don't want, of course, to, to disappoint um, um, the Filipinos. We want that, of course, to have a rallying point for our pride. But at, at least the, the, the records would say, uh, and all the logical, uh, let's say, uh, flaws, uh, 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 flaws of, uh, of, uh, of history, uh, at least in the development of the uh, expedition, suggest that uh, Magellan got him because he was useful because he was from the spice islands which he would be using later on to communicate with the people where he would be dealing with and of course another there's another thing he was not the only uh, lengua there were other lenguas in the expedition but he became very very prone lengua or the interpreter but he was the uh, lengua that became prominent because of our interest as Filipinos. And uh, as I said, the, the belief that he was a Filipino apparently come, came from the misinterpretation in that uh, in the narrative of Pigapet and other narratives says that the natives understood him. So early historians interpreted that to mean that he was actually talking in the Visayan language when in fact, as I said, it appears it was not so. Even Pigapeta, even Jan Crawford said, oh, no, 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 the, the, the early chiefs in the Philippines uh, actually spoke uh, different uh, Asian language. In fact, Tome Perez, a Portuguese uh, chronicler uh, in the 15th century, in the, early, uh, uh, in the early 16th century, was saying that there was in fact a community there in Malacca named Lozoes or Lozonis, people from Luzon, which of course at that time in the 16th century, when they speak of Luzon, they can also mean Visayans. And there was a community there uh, who were traveling almost every year, would go to Sumatra, would go to Borneo, would go to Malacca, but they, uh, they, they were mentioned as coming from, from um, uh, Luzonis. And um, of course, even during the expedition of Magellan, they captured there a certain uh, uh, son of the chieftain of Manila, was going to was going to Sumatra and going to Borneo, so the, the natives at that time were not actually confined to the Philippines. They were traveling all over Southeast Asia, and even uh, archaeologists would suggest uh, that one of the uh, one of the perquisite at the time of native chiefs is that they could speak foreign languages because if they can speak foreign language, they could deal with the foreign traders, and therefore it enhances their authority their power and their negotiate uh, their power to negotiate they're also their it also enhances their their prestige among the natives just like today if people could speak foreign languages even in the locality their their uh, their prestige seems to to rise and at the time that was also the case one of the elements of course says that a prestige at the time was of course their knowledge of foreign languages so uh, as i said that is how probably uh, Enrique was. He was not actually a Filipino and he was not, he could not speak uh, the way I look at it, uh, the, the Visayan language. Thank you, Professor Danny. Ang ganda ng insight, no, na, um, as it was earlier discussed by our writer guests and our filmmaker, na yung tendency nila in writing historical fiction is to fill in gaps dun sa historical accounts na hindi pa na define So sa perspective naman ni Professor Danny, um, inaral dahil marami siyang documents na na, na aral na. So um, isa sa mga panibagong perspective na ini-introduce niya dito is hin hindi local language literally of that place, kundi multilingual sila uh, in the area, in the region. So I'm really curious kung meron kaya tayong may inspire na mga new writers to, to explore more materials in ASEAN content. 
di ba? Parang baka mas marami tayo, mas malawak yung mga mako-cover natin na um, accounts. Um, to start off yung panel discussion natin, we have the first uh, question um, for everyone. Um, what is the historical significance of the story of Enrique in the present day for Filipinos? So we can consider kung hindi man siya Pinoy, um, ano po ba yung... Um, at bakit natin kailangan balikan yung uh, itong uh, character na to in our history na si Enrique? Is there anyone in the panel who would like to take Let, let me start just with, uh, first of all, Enrique is not a Filipino because we were not Filipinos in those days, okay? It was only in uh, later when Legaspi gave us the name Pilipinas that we became Filipino. But we were, maybe we're all arguing about that person who came, whether he came from this part of the world or this part of these islands or that specific island. Um, I don't want to joust with uh, Danilo. I'm, I, I think that he's a very uh, methodod methodological um, scholar, no? And that, that echo chamber of how you come to your conclusions is really a very important part of our uh, university system and the way the world is uh, sharing knowledge. Um, so I, I, I will not uh, try to counteract anything on, on those. Uh, when, when you were off the air, I just brought up a point that, that um, yes, none of us, neither Reni nor um, um, uh, Carla or me can prove 100% that Enrique was the first circumnavigator. We're more fascinated in broad terms that we, baka isa sa atin ng, or maybe it can even be an anti-colonial feeling. Oh, hindi naman nung uh, European palagi ang mga bida. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. we cannot prove 100% with the same um, citations like you have. But I think we cannot also prove 100% that he was not the first one. Uh, maybe there are citations that call that he was a Sumatran and that it was that he must be speaking Malayan. But I think in those days those those terms were very vague and more or less since they didn't know about Cebu, they might have said, "Oh, he was a, a Sumatran." Uh, these were maybe the first terms that came into the minds of people describing somebody from the sea, South, sea, South sea Islands. They, they were Malacan, and they, of course we also know that Enrique de Malacca was. In those days, when you buy a slave, you Christianize him and give him a Christian name, Enrique. And the Malacca just is an indication where you bought him. Not necessarily that he's from there. Maybe you bought him, in, if you bought him in Baguio, he would have been Enrique de Baguio. Anyway, in these broader terms, we artists try to allow our story to come in. And it's not just being chauvinistic and patriotistic, but it's a nice idea that the uh, he could have come from our part of the world. And so I like to write on, he was an indigenous person. So I don't stick to the Cebuano indigenous and I out of poetic, uh, we'll call it poetic license or maybe just uh, dilettantic filmmaking. I, my, my, I allowed him to wear a bahag no? because I'm from here and I know what about, I'm more familiar with bahag as a, as a costume. So it, conveniently I didn't, not want to go into research what was the real uh, clothes of, uh, of of the people in Cebu. But I'm sure everywhere in the Philippines we were all wearing bahags in those days. So my general tribute will probably sidestep some of those very solid facts that you have, um, Danilo, and I, I really uh, congratulate you for the work that you do. But even already in my mind, I we talked about legend and maybe Maybe we are creating legend as artists, and we uh, we have all these stories that that come from here and there. But nobody can disprove that those people did not exist, or that they did a certain feat. So uh, that's just just to fill you in on while you were. I hope the typhoon hasn't hit you, Danilo. Kaya ka ba na wala sa kwan sa screen? Wow. I'm Thank you very how, uh, much. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I would like my imagination is that, that, that since um, 
Enrique came from the land of typhoons. He must have been also one of those survival yes. <laughs> capacity yeah, right. of his oh, I wish surviving so many yeah. typhoons. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 What what did that? Yeah. Um, it was clear in Magellan's uh, testament that he was actually captured. He was not bought. He, uh, he was captured. So I suspect he was. He must have been. Uh, he was captured in Malacca during the Battle of Malacca. So uh, that's uh, and but I, I, I would agree uh, with what you said. It's for us historians, we cannot have we cannot have a very very definite conclusion. Also, it's a possibility that he could have he could have come to Malacca. Uh, he could have come through Sumatra. He probably came from the Philippines. It's, it's possible. But then, of course, uh, as I said, uh, we are constrained by our discipline that we, we, we limit ourselves to the conclusion based mm -hmm. only or warranted only by the documents. That, so it's a possibility. I do not discount the, pos the, the fact that it's a possibility that it could have been there. It could have been captured by pirates. So that, it's always there. But the, the point for us is how are we going to prove that? And we generally, for us, um, uh, the canon of our, our scholarship is actually con uh, uh, confined only to the, the evidence provided by, uh, by documents. So, thank you very much. Good luck. At least we artists are not constrained, like you said, to. to That's prove. right. And so we That's have right. that freedom to, but in that end, we could not also disprove. And I think that's where we enjoy feeling what the. Uh, uh, I think Renny or um, uh, Carla said, we just flesh the people with our imagination. But maybe we need that today because we also have had this colonial legacy where we, we look down on our Filipinos. We all, Talibasa, uh, Filipino, we have all these pejoratives. And because that's from 450 years of, uh, what did Chitang Nakpil say? Uh, 350 years in the convent and 50 years in Hollywood. So we have this crazy mixed up thing and we, maybe we, People who see me in Bahag, a lot, some, I think a lot of people say, Oi, that guy is uncivilized. <laughs> but I wear my Bahag with pride because I think there is a lot that, that we can still learn from them to help put our world back in balance. No? And that's why, why I like to honor Enrique as somebody who has this uh, survival and his indigenous wisdom. And if whether he was the guy that we are talking about or that specific person, I think these indigenous uh, assets of our people, our seafarers, our local people are very important to pass on to, to, the, to the kids that uh, are in the book of, and the young pe the readers in the car book of Carla. And in my case, I think I, I, I survived 40 years on this because I was the biggest, I was the kid who was so interested in this story. I was, I was, Kidlat was the kid, Kidlat, who followed and stayed with it. <laughs> so we are reaching out to other readers and at least thank you for not, for at least agreeing that maybe there is that possibility. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to ask a question. Of, let, uh, let me have one, I'll just one bite. Um, uh, would Enrique remained in, the, in Cebu, correct? So uh, Carla. that's one of the things that, yeah, that maybe he was from that area because he stayed in Cebu. He didn't go on, he didn't go back to Spain or elsewhere. Or he became a naturalized Filipino. Yeah. <laughs> he stayed or, there. Well, well, actually, Carla, based on documents, um, there were actually at least eight members of the Magellan expedition who were left behind. Um, in Cebu, after the massacre, uh, you know there was a massacre in May first, and um, at least twenty six or twenty seven of the survivors of the uh, back Battle of Mactan actually died in in Cebu. But contrary to popular belief, that we never knew anything after that uh, post Battle of Mactan event. Actually, we knew a little because there were at least eight uh, crew of the Magellan who survived the battle, who were taken prisoners. And in fact, they were sold as slaves to the Chinese. That's the document uh, in the post-Magellan expedition. I think it's the Luiza and uh, the, uh, the expedition that, that uh, came after. And they gathered certain information about these people. So we knew that there were eight 
we do not know. Probably uh, among them would probably be uh, 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 probably be uh, Enrique, but we don't really know. Also, the issue about uh, the, the fact that Enrique could have been the traitor and one who betrayed the Spaniards uh, by telling uh, the chieftain of uh, uh, Lapu-Lapu or Humabon that they ought to kill them. But I, we do not really know. Although earlier on, I so subscribed to that. But by reading again the text and other the testimonies rendered by the crew of the Magellan, because uh, after upon their arrival in Spain, they, they were asked by Charles to render certain testimonies about what happened to the Magellan expedition. And few historians have just be, begun looking at these things. And it appears that I have doubts whether it was really uh, Enrique was responsible for the massacre. The, one, the, one. the reason is because the one who testified that it was Enrique who actually uh, told Lapu-Lapu and Humabon to kill these uh, Spaniards because they are aiming for something else was actually Sebastian Del Cano. And you have to understand that Sebastian Del Cano hated Magellan very much. And Enrique was actually very, very much associated with, uh, with uh, Magellan. The other thing is the one who actually propagated also, pr promoted that story was actually Pigapeta. But you have to understand that Pigapeta plays politics. Many historians did not examine Pegapeta. They took Pegapeta's words hook, line, and sinker. But I, I'm working on the Pegapeta biography. I went to the to the house of Pegapeta in uh, Vicenza. Look at the records in Italy. I begin to entertain certain doubts about the objectivity of Pegapeta's account. He seemed to be uh, engaged also in journalistic politics. He was trying to avoid uh, playing up certain issues about mutinies, certain issues about the Spaniards, because apparently he feared that there might be reprisal at the end of the expedition. So you have to, we have to be careful also about uh, the narratives, of course. Uh, that's, uh, as historians, we also are concerned with the, the power game involved even in the, in the production of the text. And that's probably how I look at it. So I would say I would exculpate to a certain degree uh, uh, Enrique, from the accusation that he was the traitor. He was, he was the one who betrayed uh, his fellow uh, uh, members of the expedition. Yeah. Um, there is an interesting question here from Antonio Sanchez de Mora. And I think this was partly answered by Professor Herona. The question is addressed to you, Prof. Danny. Please yes. give us your opinion about Enrique's treason in Cebu. I think he assumed that he should be liberated, but was not so aggressive against the survivors. Yeah, yeah Kanjen, uh, if I may answer it. We have to understand that, first of all, uh, Duarte Barbosa, whose uh, identity is not very bad. Uh, people, uh, historians seem to uh, confuse uh, Duarte Barbosa with Duarte Barbosa, who wrote Olibro Duarte Barbosa. It was a book written in Southeast Asia, uh, published earlier than, than Magellan's uh, uh, discovery of the Philippines. It was published in 1516, and it provided a, a, a wide uh, perspective of Southeast Asia. In fact, in the, in the Libro of uh, Duarte Barbosa, it already mentioned uh, Tindaya or Samar. Uh, before Magellan ever landed uh, in the Philippines, so about three years before the, uh, 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 five years before the, the landing of Magellan here. So it was, there were two Duarte Barbosa. One is Duarte Barbosa who wrote uh, the, the yes. South Asian uh, account, yeah. Uh, and the other one was actually Duarte Barbosa who became the head of the, who became the successor of Magellan. And this guy, you, you do not know, you, they, there, there are accounts that said he was actually the, the nephew of the wife of Magellan, but it also says that he was the brother of the wife of Magellan. But one thing sure about this Duarte Barbosa, he was a very, very good person. He was, um, he was notorious for womanizing. Uh, Magellan reprimanded him in uh, South America because they were not allowed to go down to the ship, but he went down there and engaged with the women there in uh, South America. And also the other reason is this guy was also responsible, probably. In fact, Peter Marty was actually uh, putting the blame on indirectly to Duarte Barbosa because they said the reason why the people of, of Cebu killed the Spaniards was not 
was actually more of the the the, the, the crew engaged in uh, womanizing and the why the husbands and probably the brothers of the of the Cebuanos did not like it so they exacted vengeance by killing this uh, the Spaniard. but then the idea that uh, that uh, Enrique was the one responsible apparently was not uh, I, I suspect that I doubt that and uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Antonio Mora's question says apparently that's true uh, there was in the testament of Magellan it says that, that once I died then this guy will be freed uh, Enrique will be freed and and then uh, and some of my colleagues here were right in saying that he was a beloved uh, 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 Magellan. Uh, in fact, in the expedition, Magellan did not call him a sclavo. In the expedition, Magellan referred to him as a criado. So in the official account, because there were designations in the crew of the expedition, he was designated as lengua e criado del capitan. So he was a criado, not a sclavo. Uh, so a criado is a, a much better uh, designation, uh, almost the same as uh, servants, but he was, uh, as, as a criado seems to in, have freedom uh, than, uh, than, than, than a slave. So that, uh, the question is, of course, uh, I hope it answers that question of uh, Senor Antonio. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Can I just, yeah. can I add to that? Just that uh, I think, um, yung, it was the statement of Picapeta casting a judgment when he said that as we were leaving, we saw the interpreter left, stayed on the island more, and he had been more cunning than we had thought. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very nuanced sentence that says he must have been part of that conspiracy to invite the Spaniards on a pretext of a banquet, but actually planning para ma massacre sila. E, talagang traidor. Um, we don't know. It's a matter of fact, yeah, uh, uh, there have been speculations that pag na yung mga sailors <laughs> and mga magagandang mga Cebuano and Barbosa, I, now this is the first time I hear Barbosa, Barbosa was a womanizer. Sigur, that led to a kind of a brawl and it, it ended up like that. It may not have necessarily been a massacre, but Maybe Pigafetta did not know that he had a responsibility because he was recording history. But that's what he eh, yam pala, ganung ka pala. Just automatically jumped to the conclusion. None of the survivors came back. So nobody ever told how it happened, how it started. Diba? None of the survivors uh, of, that, of that master came back. So I think that's a very nice point that maybe the, <laughs> the womanizer yeah, in I can that. I just have to add to that. In fact, in the other testimonies rendered to, uh, to Charles the, the Fifth, only Sebastian Del Cano put the blame on, uh, on Enrique. But hmm. the other members of the crew, there were three or more, three, at least three, who did not even mention, did not make any reference to the treachery of Enrique. Imagine they were together, but the three did not mention. Only Sebastian Del Cano, as I was saying, because in few, uh, Sebastian Del Cano was actually connecting uh, Enrique with uh, with Magellan. So, can I ask you a question uh, on that uh, uh, that yeah. meeting they had in Villa Dolid, no, but with with the four survivors? I think Pigafetta, um, yeah, yeah. Del Cano, uh, the navigator, what's his name? Uh, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. am I correct? I had the impression that. Uh, Pigafetta gave his manuscripts and left them behind to King Carlos and later had to reconstruct from memory when he actually uh, wrote the book so that maybe there were also more added nuances or speculation or political, uh, uh, what you call political journalism in that yeah. final version that, that got printed. But am, am I correct that he, I think he left his, he, with that uh, tribunal that was uh, investigating that thing at in Villa Dulid, he left behind his 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 manuscript with them his original manuscript well it's not very clear that it, that. it appears that uh, but, but I, I I agree with what you said that apparently there were certain revisions made by Pigapetta later on in fact uh, that that's the reason why there were several languages uh, French uh, Italian because they were saying uh, well Pigapetta seems to be trying to adjust 
to the one whom he will be giving the the manuscript to uh, and the producer uh, so of the I, the producer of his film <laughs> <laughs> so if the French, like, if the French king is uh, asking for that cigarette, <laughs> yeah. So he was actually doing certain adjustments to certain degree. So that's in the way um, the manuscript was not prepared. There were certain schools of thought that said that Matigapeta made a diary on a day-to-day -day basis, but then they said it had it had been lost for some time, um, and therefore he has to reconstruct that on certain kind of an outline form and then produce a more expanded uh, form when it was already finished in 1523 after they returned, of course. So, so that in that particular case, after one year of being there, he probably began certain entertaining certain political uh, considerations uh, in producing the manuscript that he would be submitting to the king, uh, whoever that be. Uh, it's quite ironical, he did not write it in Spanish. He didn't submit it in Spanish. He wrote it in French. He wrote it in Italian, but not in Spanish. And yet he was there in the he was there in the expedition. And quite interesting. Many things were coming out. That's the reason why I said I begin to doubt certain uh, the the objectivity because of the fact that even in the even in his uh, uh, when he registered himself, he did not register as as Antonio Pigapetta. He registered as Antonio Lombardo. And even the names of his parents were not actually given the popular uh, uh, names that was familiar uh, in, in Vicenza. So he seems to be hiding certain things uh, in that particular case. And that's the reason why we have to re-examine the works of Pigapetta because that's the major source of our narratives on the expedition, including, in fact, references to Enrique. Thank you for Whoever that. Whoever said that yeah. history is boring has not read enough. <laughs> There's so much historical cheese mix. That's true. That's true, Megs. Thank you, Megs. Meg, let's let's read the other questions here. There's a question from Alex Del Mar. Fluent kaya si Enrique sa Portuguese and Spanish, or mayroon pa bang ibang wika na fluent siya? That's one question. Connected to that, uh, there is a comment from Paulina Romero. He, she says here, Anthony Reed mentions that in Malacca there were harbor masters assigned to different trader groups. Malay speakers were assigned to those from the Molucas, South Sumatra, Borneo, and the Philippines. This shows that traders from the Philippines could converse in Malay. So is it possible Enrique could still be Filipino by language alone? Yeah. So who can comment on those, uh, those questions? Well, maybe in those days, uh, classification of languages was not even very very precise and if for a european hearing hearing the malayans and the, or, or the cebuanos or the samarenos speaking it all sounded the same um i think that's why we're referring to at least he could be an interpreter and that opens that possibility that he really knew the language where did he pick it up from we don't know uh the, a lot of historians try to downplay Enrique by saying, well, uh, there was a Cebuano colony living in, in Malacca. I don't know how they found it out, but even if it's true, uh, he could have been as, I, I, I like to think of it this way, you know, Magellan bought, uh, however, he had picked up uh, Enrique in Malacca and they started this voyage and brought him on 99% of the trip. Because uh, roughly, Malacca is uh, about 900 kilometers from Cebu. So that's maybe 1% of the voyage. So Magellan completed his 99% of his na na circumnavigation. But somehow, this, this, this lad, this boy, was, who could speak or learn the language in that island was picked up by pirates brought to Malacca, so he did the 1% before Magellan took him on 99%. <laughs> so 99 plus 1, nangyari by faith. Na? But this is where we're playing on as artists, na we like to let that ambiguity become a source for our inspirations. Whereas uh, the job of uh, Danilo is to really look for the specific fact, make his building blocks and come to their conclusions. So I don't take it personally if, <laughs> if Danilo said that maybe he's not a Filipino, but at least we know that he may might have come from this part of the world. 
Well, kidlat actually uh, if, if if I will if I may add uh, there would if we will put a little some in our uh, in our uh, profession a sort of a literary license in some way will allow a certain kind of an uh, extrapolation uh, uh, there could be a possibility also if I would say uh, could it be possible that uh, uh, that uh, Enrique was a Filipino uh, there was a certain instance in Magellan in Magellan's uh, uh, okay, profession as a, as a navigator, when in fact after the after the conquest of Malacca, there was a certain report which says that that's probably they say that that's probably the reason why the king of Portugal hated Magellan after a while. That's why he transferred to Spain was because it is said that Magellan made an illegal travel uh, to to uh, the Spice Islands from Malacca. Malacca, of course, uh, were Singapore is close, uh, clo closer to Singapore. Then they traveled to uh, to uh, Spice Islands, probably went to Sumatra and other places, and even reaching as far as the Philippines. Imagine this is 1511, 1512. So could it be possible that he was guided after he captured, let's say, uh, let's say uh, Enrique in Malacca, in Malacca? Could it be Back possible that? Uh, yeah, he went. He went the way he went is. And eventually arrived in the Philippines after a few days because apparently at the time they said a week's time you can already be in the Philippines in your journey from Malacca. So I I do not discount the possibility that I was completely wrong when I say okay you are right and say <laughs> uh, 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 Enrique was not a Filipino. But so there's a, there's always a possibilities involved. Artists but, artists of the world we have an ally with Danilo. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Meg, I think there, there are questions here from Ahmad. Yes. Yeah. Hoa uh -huh. Dosman. Can you read it? A question. As a visual artist myself, I'm of course drawn to the artistic license that allows us to many possibilities to relook and reinterpret histories. But clearly, to a historian, Mr. Danilo, his story is factual, not merely fictional. My question is, how do you see the impact of Mr. Quirino, himself a respected historian, who used fiction to rewrite the history of the Philippines? Well, uh, of course, today when we speak of postmodernity, all these things, uh, there's already the convergence between uh, facts and uh, fiction, uh, speculations and, uh, and history, so-called symptomatic analysis. Even historians would also engage in what they call symptomatic analysis of facts. So there's a possibility that, well, how can we prove whether right or wrong is, is already, in a way, uh, it's already ag acceptable among historians. But of course, there are still mainstream historians like, just like me who still work on this uh, on uh, on evidence as a deciding factor in terms of our uh, our own theorizing as historians so still there's a possibility that uh, we can we can look at this particular uh, oral traditions in fact or even uh, speculations based on the few scraps of documents that we have and establish certain kind of a uh, certain belief about who Enrique was. Uh, so I do not, I, I will say, I do not absolutely discount these uh, literary elements in reconstructing our history. But the, again, the point is, are we going to, can we prove that uh, uh, historically, I would say, based on, based on historical evidence? It's a different issue. But historians can allow such kind of uh, uh, interpretations to come into play in our historical analysis. So, Baga, sir, ano to, um, you're not fixed in saying that Enrique is not Filipino, but it's more of what documents are available that's and true. what that's they true. are telling. Ayan. Yeah, we have right. another that's comment right. from Kathleen De Sodas. Thank you, guest historian, for relating some of our Philippine history. Congratulations. We Igorots are not the only tribe that use Bahag. So, can you, historian, can can find where the Igorots originated before they settled in Cordillera. Thank you, Philippine Embassy in Spain. Well, um, good luck. Okay, there were all these old theories that uh, the people who went to Cordillera were from migrations of uh, who came with the with the ocean currents and the trade winds, no. Um, but then, of course, there are also these new theories. I, I was mentioning, Danilo, that uh, there was this Bellwood 
original Austronesian theory that they became from China by Formosa, but now this is being challenged by Oppenheimer. Oh, I'm sounding like a <laughs> PhD, uh, yeah. who has been uh, bringing up the possibility that that when they came from Formosa, uh, no, that, that it was the Austronesians that started in the South Sea Islands and start because they were seafarers, they reached as far as Hawaii on the, on the west, on the east, and Madagascar on the west. So, who arrived from which direction is a uh, yeah that's going to be now interdisciplinary proving. You know, it's, it's storytelling, myths and mythologies, uh, genetics, linguistics, etc. But um, the the myths of the also of the Cordillerans is they also talk about the Great Flood, no? That they were Bugan and uh, Wagan were at brother and sister who were left on top of the mountains after a Great Flood. So these are all now uh, maybe lowering the credibility of the first people who said we came from there or they came from there. I think maybe there is a possibility that we were here already um, and maybe just that the, uh, the ice um, glacial melting pushed us higher and higher into the mountains out of necessity. But I don't know if we can prove ever, ever whether we came from that island or from that archipelago. If I can answer that question, the Cordilleras believe that they were here all the time. <laughs> well, I think the question there, Gidlat, uh, uh, is I think it can only be answered by archaeologists. Uh, but it's very difficult to answer that uh, from the perspective of historians who rely only on, as I said, on written documents and evidence uh, that have been uh, in the what you call historical period. So probably the answer could come from the grounds, uh, from uh, genetics or probably from other uh, disciplines other than uh, that of a historian. Thank you, everyone. Um, before before we, we proceed towards the end of the webinar, I would really like to ask all of you for, for your final message. Um, I would like to give a few minutes to to all our speakers uh, what final message would they like to impart to the viewers after watching this webinar on Enrique and after sharing your views what is the role of fiction what is the role of history in molding the minds of our our viewers particularly our young watchers so we can start with Rennie then followed by Carla Kidlat and then Finally, with Prof. Danny. Yeah, I, I find it very interesting, Abby, that uh, uh, this webinar is emanating from the Philippine Embassy in Spain. Uh, <laughs> Our Trojan horse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, as it's been pointed out tonight, uh, we have sort of been a slave to colonial, uh, a colonial interpretation of our history. And that's why I'm so encouraged by these comments that have been uh, filtered into this show from people who are naturally curious about Enrique and all that he represents. Um, and, and I hope this is a, a touchstone or a starting point for Filipinos to start talk, taking our own history in our own hands and interpreting, interpreting our our story uh, through our own eyes. Uh, it's high time that it's high time that we do that. Um, yeah, that's that's let Enrique be the starting point of a of a very fruitful conversation. Thanks. Yeah, um, I would like to say um, when we were first discussing this webinar with Meg and Rennie. Uh, Meg, you actually brought up the why we why Filipinos love Korean dramas, particularly the historical Korean dramas. I have to admit, I am a fan of Korean historical dramas because I love the way the Koreans have picked up, like for example, one of my favorites is this one called Sa Indang. And it's about this very obscure female Korean artist. And they've been able to 
to uh, portray a life, a heroic life, and this woman fighting for her craft, and well, just to make it's it's it shows how much Koreans love their country, love their history, and I think that's what's lacking with us in our in our teleseries in our. Uh, we don't see this love for country. And I think it's really because we, we don't value our history. Uh, and we only, and we're only hearing it again, we've been hearing it for a very long time from the Western point of view. And so we now need to be hearing our stories, but that's really also what history is, is it's our story from our point of view, from the Filipinos point of view. And, Hopefully that will create really a love for country, a love for nation, and maybe it, it, it will help more in our education and our progress in our development as a nation. I think that's very important. That, that, yeah, that, that's all I want. It's, it's like really we should be exploring our history. So Kidlat, <laughs> can we hear from you? It's your turn. <laughs> okay, I'd like to end with a visual, maybe, which might be metaphorically connected with what we're talking, like always taking the history from the point of view of the others, no? from outside, or <clears throat> seeing, getting a worldview because Hollywood has bombarded us with all kinds of stories. Um, <clears throat> Let me show you this sculpture. Um, he's on a boat. <laughs> and this guy has a coat and tie, but he's wearing his tie down, he's the bahag. No? <laughs> we Cordilleran say we wear the coat and tie, but we wear our tie around the waist. Anyway, if you recognize him a little bit more, this is, I had this carving made, it's Jose Rizal. He's holding his Nolly book. And I uh, was inspired to do this because uh, Ambit Ocampo was always asking the question, what's underneath the overcoat? <laughs> what's underneath the overcoat? So I imagine that uh, Rizal had this uh, kind of a spiritual bahag. You know? He was still connected with his, with his uh, indigenous roots, even if he was already a lowlander who had been Christianized or uh, Hispanized in Spain. And today we, we are always admiring Jose Rizal for, wow, see Jose Rizal, he wrote novels in Espanol. Wow, Jose Rizal operated on his mother's eyes with Western ophthalmology. Wow, Magellan designed and built irrigation systems in the Pitan while he was in exile with Western engineering. Now, I think we shouldn't be admiring him for because he was so Westernized and did all those things, but more that he was able to be flexible, pick up all those other things that, we, that could be useful here, but because he was certain about himself, because he was still wearing his spiritual bahag, okay? I'm sure that the historians will lynch me on this because there's no proof that we, we don't know about how the people in Kalamba were dressed before that. But I think this is what we're talking about today, that uh, <clears throat> we can, uh, uh, Danilo and has his uh, academic uh, training and that he has to build his, his uh, storytelling from whatever citations he can get. No? And we have, have a certain uh, flair, call it flair or call it license, but because we're trying to look for something that's relevant to the, to, to, to the Filipinos today. And so we're looking for heroes and we find a nice story. It's not just because it's a story, but it also has some, a little bit of historical uh, foundation to it. So if we can salvage from that story, something that will be important and in this way like I say when if Rizal we can look at him as somebody who also was he was westernized but he must have still had something 
from his own country that made him even die for his country. And in this sense, let's get, find more heroes and let's not get stuck with Pepe, <laughs> but let's find our heroes that, and I think the young people are looking for them. And I hope if any of you listeners are young filmmakers or potential writers or potential painters, let's look into the 7,000 islands. Maraming sulok dyan, maraming bayani, maraming nating pagkikwentohan. Sugod, mga kapatid. <laughs> Danny? Yeah, um, Meg, ah, sorry. Um, I, would, I could only say that I think today again, uh, Enrique re, uh, united us. Uh, 500 years ago, Enrique became the point of convergence of a cultural dialogue between the Europeans and the natives. Today, uh, there is a certain kind of a, uh, convergence among uh, different disciplines, as history, literature, film. And I think uh, it brought us together, again, this time through the initiative of the of Congen and the, uh, the Philippine Embassy in Madrid, that we talk about him again. It's, it's actually a nostalgic journey back. But at the same time, it's a realization that at the end of the day, we have one thing in common. Uh, Spaniards, Filipinos, uh, scholars, historians, um, uh, literati, uh, literature experts, and uh, filmmakers. And I think this is, for me, the legacy of Enrique today. It brought us together and talk about him and talk about him with all the freedom that we can uh, master uh, and um, in this particular dialogue regarding who Enrique was. Thank you very much. Meg, of course, I shouldn't forget you. Please share your thoughts. To recap the discussion points from today, um, hoping that we have aspiring writers or uh, creatives in our audience tonight or wherever you are in the world. Um, so when we started discussing, it's interesting that we have a good mix here we have the creatives and we have a historian. So someone is fact-based, someone is more open to interpretations. But um, bottom line, if you want to start your journey into historical fiction, um, Carla pointed out that we should first get interested. Parang what of history bad do you want to, to document? Um, your interest will drive you to that material. That was... Um, it was explained that Enrique was that interesting for us because it's so his story is so open ended, um, so the, it's easy for for the creatives to imagine and fill in the gaps uh, what could have been. Um, that was it was pointed out then by Professor Danny that historians base their interpretations from evidence, and since interpretations can be subjective, it's open pa rin to, uh, hindi dahil yun yung nakasulat sa document, yun na yung um, it's set in stone. Uh, it can still be uh, explored further. Um, I guess uh, we hope that we can, the audience can take away from this discussion that there's a lot of stories we can develop or take inspiration from and hopefully we can tell um, another generation like um, Granny with the picture book of Enrique, um, Carla with the young adult novel, we have Kidlat with film, with film uh, which hopefully we can view in full by next year. And then we have Professor Danny who gets the, helps us um, get, see, see things through, uh, see the, the facts as they are, and well, push us to more possibilities hopefully instead of um, putting walls in what we can write. Uh, I guess that's it. Hopefully insightful then for our audience um, making discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Actually, um, you know, my daughter and I were working on this, if you can see. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are paper cutouts from the National Quincentennial Committee. You may download that from their website. No? So they're really uh, trying 
to reach out to our young viewers and make them make them really interested in history. Um, historians, writers, artists, all of you will continue to discuss whether indeed Enrique was the first to circumnavigate the world, um, whether he will be the first Balikbayan, he is the first seafarer. Uh, that is really subject to continuous debate, but um, we thank the, our discussants here for sharing their views. And Meg, thank you for summing up the views of our guests and also for co-hosting this activity with me. And we're really very grateful, again, to feature our guests, Renny Rojas, Carla Pasis, Kidlat Tahimik, and Dani Herona. We hope that for this evening, at least, we have picked your curiosity, we have steered your imagination, and also, more importantly, we made you more interested in history, our history. And as one of our speakers have said, let's continue to find and identify heroes, our heroes. So on behalf of Ambassador Philip Luillier, I would like to thank everyone for watching this video. If you have questions to our guests, we will post their emails and then you can ask them directly. And um, sa mga guests po natin, feel free if you have a project that you have in mind, uh, the Philippine Embassy in Spain will always be happy to collaborate with you. So on this note, marami pong salamat and magandang umaga, magandang hapon, magandang gabi po sa inyo lahat. Thank you very much. Ar Arriba 2021. See you. <laughs> See you here in Spain. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.